Welcome to Facing the Canon. My guest on the program is Bishop John Francis, overseer of the RUAC Network of Churches. Bishop John Francis, welcome to Facing the Canon. Thank you for inviting me. Good to be here. I'm delighted and I've, I've had the privilege and the joy of preaching in your church. Yes. And also both of us sharing at a conference that yes. we love. So it, it's great to have you on the program. Now, you were born where? Born in the UK. I'm, I'm an East Londoner, you know, I'm born in Hackney. Um, uh, my parents came from Jamaica. Um, they're the what we call the Windrush generation. Yes. Anybody knows about the Windrush? Absolutely. These are those who came after the war. And so, yeah, I was born um, there. The great part of my life is that I'm the miracle child. I was born after my mother got healed from cancer. Yes, yes. because what, she was sent home, yes. basically go home to die. to die. Yes, yes. And what happened? Okay, so basically she had cancer and um, she got so bad till she was like skin and bone I was told because I wasn't born yet and um and all her hair her skin turned real jet black and um they sent her home to die because they said there's nothing we could do for and my father who at the time he was a bishop he was a leader of a church um said oh, I'm not having this and got everybody to take some time out and pray and fasting and um, the story is quite amazing. He was like, Lord, I can't live without my wife. You're going to have to heal her. And so um, while he was praying, he had an opportunity to go and see someone in the mental institute who was not well, a sister who was in church, but she was not well. So he went to see her. And when he went there, she said to him, oh, I've had this dream. And he said about your wife and um, that you must take you must take some stones from your back garden, put it in some water and pray over the water and give it to her to drink and she's going to be healed from cancer. And so my dad <laughs> said, OK, and he literally did what the lady told him to do. And guess what? He took the water, took the, the, the stones, um, put it in the water, prayed over it, gave it to drink. And she was miraculously healed from the cancer. The cancer left her in the form of corruption of blood through yes. her nose and mouth. Um, just to give you the idea of what Incredible. I was told, told that she was um, given tablets and the tablets were so strong that she could only have half of those tablets. And, um, and she never slept for how many, for how long, because the pain was intense. So... Yeah, as I said, he gave her, prayed, and she got miraculously healed. Right. She threw up. All of this thing came out of her. And then for the first time, she slept for two days, just nonstop. So I remember talking to my dad. I said, Dad, um, stones from the garden, water, pray over it. Um, the lady's in a mental institute. <laughs> yes. Okay, this don't sound crazy. No. This don't sound right to me. It sounds crazy. What made you do it? Yes. <laughs> and he said to me, John, he goes, I'm going to be honest. Number one, I was desperate. And number two, I felt the spirit of the Lord said, this is it. Yeah. And he said something moved in him. And he said he just obeyed. And when he obeyed, that was the result. I know. And we have actually, we have several examples in the Bible, don't <laughs> you know, we? Yes. You know, go and wash in the... Shiloh, yes. Yeah, it's go and... Go and do yeah, this. Yeah, I yeah, know. Yeah. How remarkable. So you are a miracle. <laughs> yes. So baby. I was born after she was healed from cancer, and um, my mother went on to live for many years. She died in her nineties. Amazing. So um, she lived a good life. Amazing. You you grew up in a Christian home. Yes. Uh, but when did faith become personal to you? Okay. So one of the things my dad was a bishop and um, leader of a church. And so the expectation is, you know, come from a Christian home, uh, you're supposed to be a Christian. And um, but I was that ordinary child who was at school and, you know, 
not the best of child, you know, fight, do all the things that every kid would do. Um, but then when I came to church, I would try my best to kind of, you know, be that Christian person I was. Um, but I feel that the big change happened in my life. I did give my life to Christ at a young age, at seven. But the real change happened in my life was one day when I got filled with the Holy Spirit. Yes. I went to a, a revival crusade that was happening in Islington Town Hall. And in those days, um, there was a powerful woman. Her name was um, Reverend Dr. O.V. Paris, Oliver yes. Paris. Yes. She was um, come out of, if for those who understand about revival crusades, she came out of the sort of... Um, the, the, the style of A.A. A. Allen. Yes. Because she was very much close with that ministry back in those days. Um, and so it, it was very unusual. One, it was a woman. Two, having that kind of woman that would be doing, uh, praying for people and instant miracles. Yes. I mean, and I'm telling you, some great things happened in her ministry. And I remember that night, it was a Friday night, and I said, I came to that service that night, and um, there was this lady in a, a wheelchair, a crippled lady. And I remember looking and I said, God, if she comes out of that wheelchair, that day they called it Holy Spirit. That's right. And I said, if she comes out of that wheelchair tonight, I am going to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I just yeah. knew it. And so it was amazing. In the middle of the service, I don't remember what was going on. Some singing was going on. And Reverend Pat just got up and she came off the, the stage of the town hall. And then just went straight to the lady and then grabbed her by the hand. And she just immediately came out of the wheelchair and she started to walk and walk. And then she took the wheelchair and she was rolling the wheelchair around her, And the place was electrified. I mean, people were just screaming and because it was a miracle right in front of us. And just and, and with her ministry, you used to see things like that yes. always happen. And um, that night. They said, all those who want to be filled with the Holy Spirit, I said, that's it. That's it. I'm coming. And I went there. And I, it was really funny because I was like, okay, how's this going to happen? Because sometimes you see people fall out and all kinds of things. Sure. And I, I, were, I was very conscious. And I was like, oh, feel, Holy Spirit, fill me, fill me, fill me, fill me, fill me, and fill me. And I was just talking to God, praising God, thanking Him. And then all of a sudden I felt, it was really strange. It was like a buzz, but it was burning. And yeah. I could feel it on my feet. And I could feel it like it's coming up, it's coming up. I said, this is it, this is it, this is it. And I opened my mouth because I just felt like if I open my mouth, it's yes. going to happen because I could feel this thing coming over me. And then, bam, I started speaking in tongues. I was conscious. I was not out. And I was like, oh, this is it. My tongues was going and speaking. And then I was like, oh, my gosh, how am I going to stop? Because <laughs> I just didn't know how to stop. And I remember... Um, it kind of slowed down. Then I was trying to talk in English to yes. someone and it kept coming out in tongues and what have you. And then later on, I got an after that. That was when my life had changed. Sure. And then I went back to school and my friend who, his name was David Daniels, he he knew my lifestyle. Yes. And he saw the change in me. And we started ministering to people in the school and 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 witnessing and then everybody was confused because this is the guy who used to cause so much yes. trouble always fighting and now i'm preaching to them and we used what was so powerful jay john that we oh. had the room called the <laughs> referral room in our school where all the bad kids would yes go. yes we used that room to have prayer meetings amazing there, and people started getting saved and um, one now, one of the guys who he's an evangelist now, who got saved in in our prayer meetings. Amazing. Well, press on into the future. The yeah. Lord led you yeah. into gospel music. Yes. Right. How did that happen? Right. So, where I lived in my father's church was on top, was um, the church, and down below was the the actual church. So our flats was upstairs. The, the church was down below it. So obviously I grew up around all kinds of music. Yes. Everything was there and uh, my brothers played and it was expected, you know, when the other one moves on to the university, I come on now and play. So I was, I learned to play all music, guitar, bass, drum, keyboard, everything. So musical thing was in me. 
Um, I think the real turn was when my father went to America for one year and three months, and then he came back and he brought me some gospel music. <laughs> yes. And that was like in the 70s. And I'd never heard music like this before. And I was like enjoying it. It was a guy named James Cleveland back in the day and the Southern California Community Choir. And I thought, wow, that was great. So my big thing was I need to go to America. And I'm, I remember my mum, because I said, mum, I want to go to America. I want to go. And at that time, our church was affiliated with American yes. church. And I said, mum, I want to go. And she goes, OK, we're going to get you to America. And that time there was um, uh, a thing called Freddie Laker. Yeah. Uh, I don't know yes. anybody. Yes. I'm, I'm giving my age no. now. And I never forget it was 99 pounds. That for, was before it went past. Yes, before yes. they went past. Freddie Laker Airlines. And we that's how we got to America. The America. And when I went to America, I met this guy named Douglas Miller, who was a keyboardist and singer. And I, I never saw anything like this. So I got to be a part of the choir. And they, they, what they did, because the convention happens in the evening and in the day, but at nighttime they do rehearsals. Yes. And we learn about five, six songs in one night and then we sing it the next day. And I never knew, we could, because I'm used to rehearsing for like five weeks or five months, literally, before we sing. That was in the UK. But they had a technique of learning very quickly. I was blown away by the whole of that. And when I came back, I was like, right, I've got to come back to England, start my own choir, and do my own thing. And that's how the Inspirational Gospel Amazing. Choir started. And um, and it was incredible, the Inspirational uh, Gospel Choir. Yeah. It's influence. I mean, in yes. many ways, um, Bishop John, you were quite a pioneer yes. with gospel music. Definitely. What happened was I started the choir and, you know, we were singing for the Princess of Wales. Queen, yes. Everywhere. A night of a hundred stars in the Palladium, all of these kind of big things we did, because um, then we got signed to a major record company called CBS. And also, I, when you talk about pioneering, I was also a part of pioneering the London Community Gospel Choir. Yes. Because uh, in fact, what happened? I had an event at my church, and a few singers. We all came together, and we sang. And after we sang, I said, you know, we should do something more with this. Yes. Because my choir was more or less group of people from my church but we wanted to do something more community sure. based and so that's how the london community gospel Amazing. choir actually happened so yeah i was and it to... just kept growing but and yeah. then you got a phone call from the pop group madness yes and they are saying hey we want you to come and back us for our new song was it called a wings, wings of, of a dove, dove. yeah that's yeah. right yeah you know all that stuff <laughs> wow yeah so in fact that was the the move from singing outside of the church world to the secular world. Yes, I know. Uh, yeah. I, I played it. I got Alexa to play it yesterday. Okay. And I heard it again. Did you hear it? Yes. Yeah. yeah. But, so here's the funny thing about that story, because what happened, we got involved in a competition that was on um, uh, London Weekend Television. Yes. Is that the one you, you came second? Yes. Called yes. Black and Black. And by Trevor Phillips. You know Trevor Phillips that you see? Yes. On? So it was his show. And I got on there, and after that, that's where Suggs from Madness saw us and said, oh, we'd like you to come and sing a song on, you know, uh, Wings of a Dove. I immediately said, no, no. First of all, it's Madness. And remember, I'm a Christian. This is, <laughs> yeah. you, you go, yeah, you, that, your group is Madness. Yeah, and this that, is don't sit well. a Madness idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, and those days, Madness had that, you know, freaky way of singing and carrying on, and I was like, no, that's not going to happen. And my dad turned around and said, which shocked me because my dad's very strict. He said, oh, no, no, wait a minute. This could be God. Yes. I was like, God, this can't be God. This is madness. <laughs> and he said, no, John, listen to what they got to say. So sure. we had the meeting and they explained to us, look, this is the song. It's called Wings of a Dove. And if there's any words that you find offensive, we will remove it. Yes. And, and, because we really want you to come and sing on this song. And so we looked at the lyrics. There was nothing wrong with the lyrics. No. And I thought, okay, my dad says, you know, I think you should do it. This is it. And I was really looking at him like, is he all right? Because he's telling me to sing with this group. Um, we did it and it got to number two in the I national know. charts. It's, didn't it sell a quarter of a million? Yes, it did. Yeah. I know. Yeah. And it, I mean, a quarter of a million I in know those so days. Much. Oh, no, gosh. But to sell that yes. amount of records yes. in those days, yeah. it, won a, it won an it award. Did. It did. It did. Um, you ended up getting ordained in your father's church. Yes. And then you felt the call to go and plant a church. So yeah. 
So here is John Francis, yeah. the gospel singer, yes. who now begins to become John Francis, the pastor preacher. Yes. So when you birthed your church, was music an influence? Okay, so let me just go back yes. into the thing of leaving my father's church, which was something you don't do. Yeah. Um, and it was not celebrated at all um, because I was looked at rebellious. Now, you've got to understand, my father's church was very traditional. And when I say traditional, we came from the background where um, in our church, my father's church, no jewelry, no makeup, very always have your head covered, yes. all of that kind of structure. And so when I left there, um, my, I got a funny thing is I left there with my father's blessing, but then he turned because it was like he was a prominent leader in the church, especially in the black community. And for yes. me, it was the, I, it was seen as me being rebellious yes. and doing all of this. And um, yeah, it was not it was not um, it didn't go down very well. But then I started the church and what was and, so... And was it with 18 people? 18 people. Initially, 18 people said, we'll, we'll join you. Well, 80, what the first service who attended was 18 people. And I said, Lord, if one person gets saved, then I know this is your will. Because I was going through so much negativity at the time. But I said, Lord, if one person gets saved, give their life to Christ, then I know it's your will. Guess what happened? One person got one saved. Person. I should have asked for more, but I just, that was what happened. One person got saved, and then I knew it was God. But it was like first fruits, first wasn't fruit. it? De definitely. And then within three months, now you've got to see back then, a, a mega church was like 300 people. Yes, that's right. I had 150 people within three months. Yes. Packed until we had to move from the place we were into the town or... And people just kept coming, giving their life to Christ. And that time, Brixton was a place that most people didn't really like because it, you know, just came after yeah, the riots. Sure. <clears throat> there was a lot of um, questionable people that was in that area um, in terms of Jamaican yardies, yes, people with guns yes, and stuff yes. like that. And we were seeing these kind of people, life being changed, people coming... I remember the first time I was preaching and after they brought a gun and brought it, I was like, what do I do with this? You know, because I'm like, did this gun come from somewhere? Did it kill someone? I don't know. But that was the kind of situation that was happening. Sure. And literally people who came from questionable backgrounds, their life got changed. And I, I got people in my church now who's, uh, you know, they came from a rough life. Some of them now have got their own business, their life turned around, got family. Amazing. That was amazing. Time. And then oh, it went on from there. You, you, you're you currently in various places around. You planted several locations. Yes. How many churches are there that are linked into what is now called RUAC? Yeah. So what happened, to give you the story, Brixton, we started in Brixton, and then we bought our building in, in, um, in, in Brixton Hill. And we started having one service and we had packed that. And we had yeah. a second service, we packed that. And then we ended up having five services. Oh, and so we were like, we needed to get a building. Yes. So I was trying to get a building and the building was supposed to be somewhere in South London. But it, it you know how it's hard to find of properties. Course. And, and so um, we were, I mean, it was bad. Every Sunday they would literally, you open the door, you'd think it was um, Harrod's sales. Yes. When everybody's rushing through the doors to get in. And I was like, God, what are you going to do? We need we need a place. We need a place. And so um, I got a developer friend who said to me, oh, I have a place in Battersea, so which wasn't so bad. We were going to buy it, but that fell through. And he goes, don't worry, there's another property in Kilburn. I goes, Kilburn, I don't want to go to Kilburn. That's way out. Um, and so basically I went into this building, and that's the building you came in. And yes. what happened was it took me like... Um, 30 minutes to get to the building, which was surprising. I was like, that's not that bad. I think it was about 20, 30 minutes. Yes. I was like, it's not that bad from Brixton. I think the Lord's trying to climatize me to the idea because I was not with it. And then 
there's two things I like. I like marble stairs and I like chandeliers. Yes. I walked in, I looked up, I saw the chandeliers. I was like, oh my God, look at these chandeliers. They're beautiful. Yes. And then I walked up, I goes, oh my gosh, look at those steps. Yes. And I was like this. And then I heard the devil says, just go away. Just, just turn around, yeah. go back. There's no way you're going to get a building. Number one, you're black. Like I didn't know I was black. The devil always says some stupid stuff. <laughs> then the yeah. next thing he says, and you're a church. They're not going to give a church a building like this. Then I heard God said, if you want it, ask me for it. Yes. And I said, yes, God, I want it. Yes. And that I didn't even see that auditorium. I just saw the, the front. That was what I heard. And then when I got in and I started seeing, at the time they were playing bingo. And I was looking through and I was like, wow. And then I went on the balcony. I was beating my friend. I said, God, I want it. I want it. I want it. Yeah. And what have you. And the, the story is that three months, um, they sold it to someone else. With No, within a month, they sold it to someone else. Yes. And I was devastated. And I said, but God, you told me. Yes. And I was like, I don't get this. And then the Lord said to me, phone the guy, the sales guy, and tell him. No, first of all, I heard that the building, they had put a deposit on it, but they didn't complete. Right. And that's when I heard the Lord said, phone the guy who said his name was Toby and tell him that the Lord said that building is mine. Yes. And so I thought, all right. So I picked up the phone. I goes, hi, Toby. Um, it's Reverend Francis here. He goes, yeah. I goes, um, God told me to tell you, no matter who you try to sell that building, it's building mine. Is mine. And he started swearing on the phone. And he goes, you ain't got enough money. You don't even know how many people, because a lot of people was after that. And he put the phone down on me. And I went, God, he put the phone down on me. Yeah, you, yeah. you told me to say this and he cursed me out and he put the phone down on me. Anyway, everyone, they tried to sell this building. It would, It's just like God would never let the thing complete. And the Lord said to me, call again. I said, oh gosh. I know. And I thought, I'm not going to go through this again. Yeah. I called him, I go. This is like the persistent widow and the <laughs> judge. Exactly. <laughs> so I picked up and I said, um, Toby, it's me again. I goes, Toby, didn't I tell you that God said, he said it's, ours. it's ours? Yes. And Toby swore again. And then he goes, I don't know what you're doing. Now, he started to say, make it sound like I'm doing something funny. Yeah, 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 he goes, yeah. I don't know what you're doing. Well, I don't know why I can't sell this building. I don't know what's going on. And I said, because well, God said it's ours. And he goes, how much money have you got? Yeah. And I went, eight million. He didn't have no eight million. <laughs> I was like, eight million. Um, I got the money. I, and one of the greatest things that happened was, I said, hold on a minute. Let me get the bank manager to speak to you. Mm. I got the bank manager. And something that banks should never do yes. is pick up and speak to an agent and say, yeah, we can do the deal. Yes. But God used him to kind of get the man's heart towards us, to listen to us, because the bank manager's talking. And the long short of it, we ended up buying this building. Yes. it's Not even with the same bank manager who phoned. (laughs) It was another, and we got in it. But here's the point to answer your question was, we didn't plan to have different locations. What happened was, when we got, I was like, okay, do I shift the whole of the congregation over there? And then I thought, but some people are not going to go. No, it's just a bit too far. Yeah. Yes, and they and live over in Brixton. Yeah. Now, here's the funny thing is just a couple of months before all of this, I went to a friend of mine in the States. I didn't understand. You know, you in America, they got all these campuses. <laughs> yes. And this guy came and he said to me, um, I want to show you all my campuses. And I was like, I'm not really interested. I just wanted to see one because we're trying to just have one new building. And you're going to tell me to go and see three, four different campuses. And so he showed me and he goes, this is how we do it. And he was just talking about, I really was not interested, but I thought, oh, just let me be the polite British person I am and let him talk all he needs to talk. Yes. I goes, just showing off about all these campuses he has. And I just didn't get it. And then when we were in our trustee meeting and I was saying, okay, we're going to try and, you know, um, move the congregation. One of my trustees said to him, if it's not broken, why are you fixing it? So I said, sure. what do you mean? He said, why are we doing that? Why don't we just have a service there and see what happens rather than trying to bring everybody over and then those who want to go, what have you. And you got to understand, people coming from all parts of London. So I didn't realise there was yeah. a great contingency of people anyway over there. And so we, we said, okay, we moved in there and had our first service and I think it was like 600 people came to the first service and what have you. And then I was like, wow. Um, And then the Lord spoke to me and said to me, that's why I took you 
to that place yes. in Nashville and the pastor was showing you everything yes. and you were getting irritated because I'm trying to show you the next model for the church. And so that's how, and then here's the real crazy thing. We had not actually opened the building at Kilburn and then I, the Lord said to me, open up another location yes. in East London. I thought, how am I going to tell my trustees this? this yes, this. I've just done this. <laughs> you know what I mean? How am I going to explain all of this to them? And I was like, okay, Lord. And so I was in my trustee meeting and they were talking. And the chairman of the trustee, we got to the part called A, B, any other business. And he looked at me and he said, any other business? And he goes, any other buildings? And I said, flesh and blood did not reveal that unto you. That's my father, which in heaven. I goes, yes. Say. He goes, but I'm joking. I goes, well, I'm not. No. I says, I did not know how to bring this up. And the Holy Spirit used you to ask if there's another building. I goes, yes, there is another building. I says, there's a building in East London. Yes. And um, basically, it, um, I've done a deal. They are w willing to do a deal of, of a lease to buy. And so if it doesn't work out, yes. we can just, you know, forget about the whole deal. But he goes, yeah, but we haven't even moved into this building yet. I said, let me just say, this is what the Holy Spirit told me to do. If it ain't of God, we'll see. Yes. Yeah. And then he was going, but I was joking. I goes, no, you were joking, but God used you to bring it up. And that's how the whole thing happened. Location in Birmingham, location in uh, Brixton, location in East London, Philadelphia. And um, and um, we're still spreading our wings. You're still spreading. Yeah, yeah. I, I love Kilburn. I loved coming to your church, um, oh, thank you. uh, Bishop John. I, you know, just the uh, the vibrancy of it, the passion, the heart, the creativity, yes. and you're a church for the community. Yeah, and you're you're making the gospel uh, accessible and relevant. That's right. And yeah. it, I, I, you know, multicultural, yes. cosmopolitan. Yeah, uh, we loved having you. In fact, people always talk about the last time. In fact. When you came to church and ministered, I never forget about you got such a great gift from God. Um, and everybody was convicted about not taking part in ministry. And I had this big list of people um, putting their names down to join ministry and stuff because I, I think the word you preach convicted them. It's powerful. Oh, Bishop Francis, you, you're a man of faith, and both you and your wife uh, have been faithful yes. and uh, you're an absolute tonic and it's been a joy to have you on Facing the Canon. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. I hope that has inspired you. It certainly has inspired me and I, I kind of feel I've got more expectancy to believe more for God to act in my life and in the lives of others. Thank you so much for joining us on Facing the Canon. Please join us again.